there's a dramatic shot of the outside of the building, and we can see concrete columns corralling the building like a cage as steel plates start to roll out from them almost over every single window. The whole building comes alive with a hum as those black spikes on the outside of the tower start to vibrate in oscillating patterns, canceling out whatever effects the storm would have on the glass that cages in the party. We see some people move to the one window that's left open, turn from a 40 foot tall vista into a shallow like 5 foot tall viewing platform, the sides pulled in like you're going to the movies. And as we see some people move to those treated windows, the color changing to whatever Kaz's whims dictate, we see the storm start to move in, billowing over the edge of the canyon. The winds picking up to 10, 20 miles per hour, and we just see these dark clouds uh, lit up with the orange coming in from the Sun River, and inside of those clouds, bubbles of ball lightning floating like dancing lights, like the will-o'-wisps looking for those they can devour. hops lively down from the table. He's changed outfits. He is now in his lockdown party outfit. A long floor-length overcoat made of velvet. Like a, a thick pea coat is what he's wearing on top. Underneath it, he is wearing an entirely made of mesh replica of a suit. The shirt is buttoned up. There's a mesh tie. The only concession to modesty is a roughly speedo portion in the middle that's made out of like a fine like wool trouser. Everything else sheer mesh and an extravagant top hat on his head. He strolls across the floor, nodding and smiling at a few party goers, taking in a few shots along the way until he walks up behind Harriet Schreckengast. Harriet, what are you doing still here? Well, I, I thought I had quite a lot of time, dear, and it seems, it seems you've shut down a bit too early. The storm's not due to arrive for another 30 minutes, at least an hour, and I was telling this thing that I, I simply need to leave. She motions to Hazel, the best security money can't buy. You don't know much about Hazel, except that she's a new addition to the Rook family. She stands about six foot two, and her entire noon radiation riddled body has been replaced almost entirely with cybernetics. Any part you can imagine on her, including all of her internal organs, have been replaced, and many of them replaced to add an air of intimidation. Her face is the most striking feature. Uh, metal plates and studs frame her face, and both of her eyes are just flat steel contraptions that almost come down into a tear shape. And then in the center of her forehead is a shining purple light, like a grim cyclops, as she stands there with her arms folded on the duty you and Vivian have uh, set upon her. Kaz in the most commiserating tone that he can manage, continues with Harriet. I am so sorry. If I had known you were trying to leave, I would have made sure to delay it for even just a few more minutes. You were going to host the Shrek and Gast party tonight. This is your first one as a CEO. This is disaster. Oh, you must be gutted. Oh my God, I can't imagine. She grips her cane in a vice-like grip. Kaz, certainly you possess the power to allow me to leave, and of, of course my party has no need to be ruined. Oh, I may have a perfect solution for you. As you know, it would be extremely rude of me to excuse any guest early without asking my co-host, who's also set this entire party with me. Let's go talk to Vivian. I'm sure she and you can come to a fine arrangement that won't result in... You missing your new family's party. I'm sure she'd love to help you. A thin smile forms on her face, and her eyes narrow even further. Well, Kaz, I suppose there is always next year. Let's hope it's not shutters closed for you. 
Was Vivian aware that this was going to happen? Yes. Okay. So there's a shot from Harriet's point of view over Kaz's shoulder. Like, I think it shifts from his face being center screen to like slightly to the left. And we just see Vivian on a bar stool with Ulysses hanging around and she raises her drink to Harriet at the door. (laughs) Ulysses joins his wife in like fashion as they mirror one another, and Ulysses leans against the bar as he speaks to his wife. You know, there is something very endearing about Kaz. He's a hedonist, to be sure, but there's something pure about it. He's He really does put his heart into everything he does. I admire that. And my god, he just dazzles, doesn't he? He hardly needs any rhinestones. Ulysses takes a moment to admire the floor-length velvet overcoat with his mesh suit. I think what I like most is the way he abides the rules and flouts them at the same time. There's a certain panache that can't be found. Only, uh... Developed? Developed, intuited, perhaps. Something I clearly lack, but luckily I have a chaperone. (laughs) Do you still think of me like that? Only when you push me outside of my comfort zone. Well, I won't say I'm sorry, because it's going to be a very fun night. Well, I won't say I don't need it sometimes. After all, if I may speak about Newtonian physics for only a moment, only Mm -hmm. a moment. Everything in the universe is static, and it only changes when you act upon it. So, in that way, it's necessary for external influence. It's called work when you push and you apply effort and pressure. Believe me, I'm very familiar with work. It's, it's 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 a technical term. Hmm. We can cut away if you want. (laughs) It just fades into the distance. In case it comes up, Vivian, you know that this outfit is an homage to the original Crow family founder's outfit that's in his like official portrait. This is basically (laughs) that outfit. (laughs) Just in case it comes up. It's like great, great grandpa if he fucked. Exactly. (laughs) Hard cut to jousting. As done on the Dove Strip, jousting has a few very specific rules. First is that it is only acceptable to joust on tables. So you need long rectangular tables to tilt at each other. The second rule is that the people on the backs of the the horse, like that there's one person on each team who's gonna be the horse and there's one person on each team who's gonna be the rider. They choose what weapons they're gonna use. That's the important part for dove strip rules. Other places have like a standard, everybody uses like a, a baguette or a, a, a lacrosse racket or something like that. A lacrosse racket. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna question you know, it. a lacrosse racket. <laughs> <laughs> but since this is a party and Kaz knew there was going to be jousting tonight, he broke out special edition, like gift jousting tools, essentially. Are you familiar with Magnum uh, champagne bottles? The ones that are like the size of a toddler. They're like three, four oh. feet tall. They, they, they get enormous. Uh, in, in our world, these go for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on who made. Oof. Kaz, for this party, had very long, thin ones made that kind of replicate the idea of like a jousting spear. So we're jousting with champagne bottles. The idea being that like you should pop the cork off of your opponents and then they have to drink it. Well, then as the night has progressed into that, perhaps hors d'oeuvres have been pulled out. Much of the party that was in uh, Ophelia's den has been brought back out into the light and at some point, I think where we rejoin it is the storm is finally starting to actually roll in. And this last viewing platform that many people were still looking out, although their attention is mostly distracted by the jousting, starts to roll shut from either side on this uh, horizontal axis to finally close off the windows as the whole building starts to shake a, a, a little bit. It's mostly kept stable by the pads and the sonic technology provided in the tower. We do get shots of the city streets of violent winds, 80 miles per hour. People that have nowhere to go trying to find places to shelter in the streets. Cars that have no garages to park in left somewhere that they hope the wind won't get them. People looking longingly at these towers around them as we cut back from that wispy scene back into the laughter as a cork pops and a a dude gets sent, uh, rocked to the floor, the wind knocked out of him. And, And then there is a rock that neither of the crows have felt before in the John Henry building in their lives. A a slight shake in the floor. Doesn't feel like the pushing currents of Almanac 47. 
It doesn't feel like the floor shaking from this man falling down. It feels ominous, uh, as if something is desperately wrong. But only for a moment, as it's broken with laughter and people getting pulled up from the ground and pats on backs as the uh, jousting gets ready for its next participants. Kaz looks up from his couch that he is like deeply reclined into, having collapsed in. He looks around mid-smoke. His reaction is to look around for Claudius or any family authority figure. So I don't know if he sees Claudius, if they make eye contact, or if Claudius is even in this main room still. Claudius has been circulating, talking to various heads of families and, and the actual influencers here. And at the rock in the building, his drink spills, someone stumbles and and he laughs and uh, brushes it off and turns away and there's a look of deep deep concern on his face are there staff around more than just the party goers or the catering staff that you hire there's definitely a few long-term crow family loyalists working as security here they they have to not be contracted that way they have to be hired as something sure. else and they can't to be too obvious about being security um, but those people do exist around you. Your brother is also here somewhere, probably, although you haven't seen him at all tonight. Claudius looks around for his paralegal team that's certainly not security guards, just lawyers with guns. He's certainly never felt the building move like this, not something he knows a lot about that would have been his, uh, his wife's concern more than him. Uh, so I think he's going to go seek out anyone that would, would know anything about it, or I don't know if the, the storm would interfere with sort of making any calls. or You could make calls to anyone that has access to a landline currently, gotcha. a hard line. He'll gesture to some of the staff to go start looking and then he'll he'll make his way over to this enmeshed Kaz reclining on a couch. Hi, Uncle. Do you want a drip? And Kaz motions to the IV of uh, nutrients and water that he has going into his arm. Later, Kaz. Did you feel the building do that? Does it normally shake in that way? No, I don't know. This, this it, isn't one it, of your dramatic moments, no, is it? No, no, no. I didn't do that at all. This is only my third alpha, though. I've never... No, I haven't felt to do anything like that. Do you have anyone watching the entrances? He thinks for a moment. No? I I mean, the, the city's shut down. We're, we should be fine. Do you think the foundations are shearing? Well, I'm not sure, Kaz, but most of the heads of the important families are here in this room, so I better be damn sure that it doesn't. Kaz looks around. That This is the first time that that has occurred to him. Like, he knows that everybody important is here, but it didn't cross his mind that that would also mean that there's a lot of eggs in one basket. He motions to the attendant who pulls the IV out of his arm and, and, and slaps a, a small bandage over it. He stands up and leans in close to Claudius. I will try to excuse myself. Uh, I'll go ask. Can you hold this situation down? And he motions to the couch. I think I can hold it down without the couch. Would your friend who planned this with you have any idea? I don't think she knows much about storms. I can ask, but I, I don't think that's her area of expertise. We have one meteorologist attending tonight, though. So we can start with them. Sounds great to me, Kaz. The important part okay. is not to panic anyone. I'm not going to panic anyone. Do you have any idea what that does for a vibe? Now, please. He motions back to the couch and you see under sort of the same pile of flesh uh, and humans that, uh, that that Kaz was under, uh, the hopeful new arbiter <laughs> Felix. <laughs> Can you hold this one down? A different kind of hunting, I suppose, but sure. I'll talk to him. Thank you, Kaz. Fantastic. Also, your wine's almost done decanting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kaz, let's have you make a persuasion roll against good old Felix here and see um, if this this uh, situation is as you've described. That is an eight on persuasion. Then yes, you haven't managed to get to any talk of business yet, um, but you've managed to placate him, figure out his interests, and get him some wonderful conversation partners. Uh, what two things would you like to know about Felix with a success in a race? I think I would like to know his uh, his uh, approach to managing rights auctions, since ours is 
coming up? Yeah. Like, is he a, does he feel like a very by the book sort of person? Or is he interested in helping like maintain the status quo? That that would be a pretty important thing to me. Sure. I, if I understood his job correctly, I might not be yes, asking the right Yes, no, question. absolutely. He would. Of course, that's your biggest concern, right? The license for edicts expires in about six months. So it's coming up yeah. pretty damn fast. I, I think you'd know that it seems like you could persuade him somehow or offer him some stuff that he might be able to like swing in your direction. There's a certain level of discretion that arbiters are allowed to have every time a monopoly license goes up for auction, um, which the number of years is dependent on the monopoly in question, like fashion mm -hmm. changes every five years. Edicts is probably every like 20 years, it's up to them both to determine the prospective bidders are able to keep up with the demand that's been set by the old license holders. And also they can give a better price to the current license holders if they can prove that their service provided to the community would be higher than anyone taking over the license. And it seems mm. like he's willing to play into that heavily. So that's both exciting and worrying because, yeah, you could persuade him, but that also means that a lot of other people could persuade him. Yeah. Do I get the vibe that he's in anybody else's pocket currently? Yes. I think he lets something drop during your conversation. He says something about his good friend, Rin Fontenot, which is kind of good news for you. Yeah, that's great news. Your fraternity brothers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. hundred uh, <laughs> percent. Of course, Fontenu being on his third body, uh, the only person on Almanac that's ever body swapped twice. He went there over 200 years ago, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're, <laughs> we're distant fraternity brothers. His, his name is on the first plaque on the wall, right? Like where they do every year's class. His is in the first one. He founded the fucking fraternity. So <laughs> he's a brother in the sense that like, Hey, but uh, yeah, yeah, that that is good news. That's also a little bit worrying. But but F Fontenu has uh, we've talked about this a lot off screen. He has quite an affection for you. I think you've had quite a few things where, yeah, you know, he kind of doesn't see all the bad parts of Kaz that everybody else sees you. He sees you as sort of the heir to the Crow family because everyone else is kind of checked out, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, he's pretty good friends with um, your father, Tex, as well. Perfect. So kind okay. of good news. But I, Great. I've pulled us away from uh, what you were doing. I think you were headed yeah. down somewhere. If I pass the meteorologist that we invited to this party, I'm going to send them over to the couch. Sure. And then, uh, yeah, I want to want to track Viv down wherever she's at. Great. Where do we find uh, Vivian? Probably with Ulysses in tow. They are watching the current joust and she's trying to explain the finer points to him as explained to her by Kaz. So a terrible game of telephone. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ulysses is uh, looking on with narrowed eyes and a thoroughly perplexed expression. So why do they have uh, long sticks made of champagne? Well, because then they have to drink it. I see. So they get progressively worse at the more rounds they go. I see. And we're heavily invested in that company, so. That makes more sense to me. Hi, how are the two of you? He smiles at the two of them, grabs a nearby uh, available drink and begins to sip. We are relaxing. Learning something about your pastimes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Kaz turns to look at the table. Do you have any money on this one? Uh, no, but we are queued up to go soon, so I don't know if you're going to change <gasps> again or are you going to do it in that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, Which is fine. I can handle it, but. Of course you can. He gives her like, uh, would we high five or would we bro fist? I think it's like that forearm clasp that like cool guys do, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. With no hint of irony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatsoever. Of course you've got this. Well, then I guess we should make this super quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Uncle Claudius asked. Uh, if we could check on a potential uh, dangerous situation, would either of you want to accompany me maybe? Or Yes. Um, I guess we can talk here. Um, did you hire security for tonight? Just Hazel. We left her at the door. Okay. Um, what sort of a situation are we talking about, Kaz? Did you, just a little bit ago, did you feel like a bigger rumble than normal in the floor? I wasn't sure if it was the wind or the joust, but... <laughs> Yeah, Tabby's a big one, isn't he? <laughs> 
Um, no, it's the wind or something. But um, uh, Claudius, uh, Uncle Uncle Claudius, is a little bit worried about this situation, and I think we should investigate it. Um, I don't know how to check if a building is safe. Hearing that Claudius is worried makes Vivian very worried. Do you have a data port? Uh, yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Kaz starts searching around the little, like, alcove that they're in and then, like, shoves a little table to the side. There's a data port hidden behind it. Ulysses looks utterly relieved to have something to do, a project to focus on, and his eyes figuratively light up as Kaz shows him the port. Uh, and he moves over to it and uh, extends his right hand, and we see one of the hexes over his right index finger lifts up in a way as a detachable panel on a small hinge, uh, and from within, a small cable that matches the data port uh, protrudes, and he pulls it out with his left hand before for inserting it into the socket. Well, I should be able to check the analytics of the building at the very least. Make sure everything's Perfect. in fine condition. That can narrow things uh, down, if, perhaps. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, if you can, because uh he he like casts around until he sees one of those like crow regulars and like tries to tries to beckon them over um are you providing ulysses like full access to the building ulysses are you hacking into it what's the situation i think by default ulysses would be happy to try to break his way into it as you know a <laughs> test of skill for himself you know a small game on his way to being useful but if kaz uh, provides him with that information he's not going to complain but i don't know that he asks yeah, for it yeah that's a good question i don't know that Ka kaz wouldn't like think to offer it like if asked for would, would hand you whatever the equivalent of his like um i don't know hardware hardware key whatever it would be like this is a somewhat like analog digital world kind of thing right where like yeah. we don't wirelessly transfer everything but i would have like a little like digital key that if i plugged into a computer i got admin rights and stuff in the building totally well let's okay. see Let's see if you even need that. So I guess, Ulysses, if you want to make a computer's check, you are trying to access a lot of closed-circuited systems related to security for the building, so I think it's going to be a negative two. Blew up an eight into another eight into a three uh, is 19 minus two. Well, he gets a plus two from his data link uh, if it's for informational purposes. So I guess that's a wash. So he gets a 19. Oh uh, my God. So we, we get three raises. Yeah, so we get uh, a point of view shot from Ulysses as he uh, plugs the data jack into the port and a small monitor seems to flash over his eyes. And from his point of view, we just see lines and lines of code begins streaming up in, you know, four or five panels that he throws out in front of him to internally view much larger, although there's no visual effect from the outside or any onlookers. And he gets a small, satisfied smile uh, that just quirks the edges of his expression as he easily breaks through any kind of security protocols and has uh, the network at his fingertips. Yeah, I was going to say that you only get access to view information, but I think with that kind of crazy role, you just get the crow tower security like at this point you could undo the shutters and let the storm in if you wanted such is the power at your fingertips not all elements of the tower are under the scrutiny of security devices like cameras, specifically um, the edict creation facilities, a lot of residential areas. None of those have those because the people installing the security cameras would be the Wilder family. And you know all too well the back doors people could put in during installation. I think we see a few of the camera feeds, though, that are available to you. You first check the structural integrity of the tower. Seems to be holding fine. There was a blip just recently that shook the tower more than normal, and it doesn't seem to be in the same line as the storm. And you can sort of see that, like, the structural sonic integrity of the building, like, moving up and down in waves and eddies as the storm breaks against the tower. Uh, and this is, like, just a sharp spike, you know, like somebody hit the mic microphone during recording and then you move on to security cameras and i think we get a shot of the front door of uh, security hired from the wilders who the crows trust you know watch the lobby trying to keep some people out trying to escape the storm as you swipe past and we find there's a camera feed out in the basement a camera has been destroyed and i think we see you roll back the footage to before that camera went down the room in question is just a, a concrete 
tomb. It's a long rifle range, maybe a hundred yards, apparently held within the crow basement, although you had no idea of this. It's set up like a shooting range where you have the booths with walls separating each individual thing, and uh, you back it up to the first time you see movement as you see this scene play out. You see your sister, Luella Rook, enter with Tanya and no one else. There's an attendant looking over this sort of shoddy looking room, worn and riddled with bullet holes of uh, those not used to gun safety. You see Luella carrying a weapon you've never seen her carry before. Uh, an important fact I probably should have mentioned before this point is many people in this party are carrying weapons. It's almost a fashion statement in a way. Anyone that bought edicts from the crows is proudly displaying them on their hips. Um, and other people that can't afford such luxuries display traditional weapons on them. Because security is so limited, everyone's sort of expected to do that, and it's become a fashion statement over time. Um, the design of the gun she's carrying is like a very long hand gun, all black, and the slide seems to be like oversized along with the barrel. It's probably about uh, 11 inches long in total, and in the camera, it's hard to make out any detail of it, but it's definitely not something you've seen her carry before. It's also not any traditional designs you might see in mass production. You uh, see her pull it out, uh, her and Tanya obviously talking about something, and then she aims it down range and fires. And as she fires, it happens so quickly the first time, you have to rewind it. There's an explosion and the camera gets knocked out. And uh, we see you bring it back one frame. And there's just one frame where she's standing there aiming. Tanya's behind her, both of them wearing ear protection. And then the next frame is this explosion that seems to almost envelop the entire gun and touch Luella's face. And there's like this distortion from like the shock wave created and then the next frame there's nothing as ulysses is spooling through data he, he narrates out loud to those around him and confirms first that the building itself appears to be structurally sound and then out of idle curiosity begins to page through all the different camera feeds i think when it flashes past the lobby and he catches the glimpses of the average citizens trying to push their way in we see his jaw clench and he lingers on that foot footage for several seconds before moving on. As he watches the footage of Luella testing the gun, there is a clear bead of perspiration and his eyes widen and he ceases his narration. He takes several long moments to rewind the footage and play through it frame by frame to ensure that he what he is seeing is accurate. His eyes follow the pulse of a shockwave as the gun appears to detonate and the impact that it has on Luella's form before the feed cuts. And without another thought, his hand scrabbles at the data port. He disconnects himself and turns to the other two with a very serious expression. Kaz, there's been some sort of I, I don't, a accident or something. Do you, is there some sort of a gun range? W where would that be? Kaz's eyes narrow. There is, but he is putting together the fact that you did more than just log in and like easily just like check if the building is safe. He, he like squints kind of hard for a moment and then he looks at Vivian. Extremely nice work on this one. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Come on. Yes, we, he, we can speak about your security protocols at a later time. I'm happy to assist you. I, they were quite poor. Sh <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Keaton set those up. So I would be happy to have a conversation <laughs> with Claudius about the uh the the failings there they're really bad right like tell me it's really bad he's talking to them as he's like leading them towards a private elevator even in this moment we see a, a mixture of emotions flashing across ulysses face at the mention of keaton he gets another humored smile maybe bordering on a smirk which is then quickly chased away by another pang of panic and worry as his eyes widen once more and he continues to follow Kaz. I told Claudius he should hire somebody else, but no. 
As, as they work their way through the party, they come to what seems to be a blank wall. Kaz steps forward and somehow, in a way that neither of you can discern, locates the correct spot on the wall and very, very quickly, with a few like flicks and reconfigurations of his hands, almost taps out a secret signal against that spot of the wall and it begins to slide open to reveal a, a small elevator that would perhaps fit like six people uh, maximum. He quickly motions them inside. Is this something where we would have motioned for Hazel to come with us? Yeah, if you want to wait at the elevator, her eyebrows narrow those that still remain on her face, and she uh, stomps towards you. I'm imagining that couch that you described, Kaz, is like near the entryway where you first met Harriet. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Claudius is still there. Claudius, I don't think you've managed to have a chance to talk to Felix at all. You've just been bored to death by this meteorologist <laughs> um, who's been trying to build clout with you, talking about, you know, that this storm is the oldest storm that's existed. And it's one of the only storm systems that keeps going around the planet and almost never dissipates entirely. And you, you can follow it and blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, the clomping of Hazel is hard to miss. And as you follow her, you see this um, entryway that Kaz has opened and Hazel's stomping towards that. I think there's a, a frustrated look in his eye as he keeps trying to end this conversation and turn around towards Felix. And as, as he sees this happening, he just very abruptly says thank you to the meteorologist and turns around, totally shutting him out and looks down at Felix in this. It, it, is it just a pile of bodies on this couch? Like it's a it yeah, this is the um, the IV couch. There's a couple people there either giving out drips, which like rehydrate you so you can keep drinking um, nicely or drip drips, you know, of, of various of various forms. So I, I would imagine this is the needle couch, essentially. Gotcha. He turns around, shutting this meteorologist out, glances at Felix, tries to, to catch his eye. I think you can. You know, I'm not sure you could tell, but I think he's a little bit bored at this situation. He's definitely weighing this against like he wants wants to have this conversation, but he also knows whatever the hell is going on behind him has advanced from, we'll see if something's going on, to we're taking a private elevator down to the bottom of the building. And he doesn't trust Kaz to deal with that. So I don't know how long he has to make any conversation with this Felix. You probably got 30 seconds okay. if you want it. Bring him along. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could. Oh, God, no. Claudius doesn't know this guy at all, so he doesn't really want to do that. He turns around, looks down, and... <laughs> Mr. Felix, was it? Yes. Don't don't get up. You seem to have uh, arbitrated your way into a good position. And he kind of does that fake laugh that you have to do when you make a stupid joke at a work event. He leans down to sort of shake his hand. Felix gives you a, a broad smile as he runs one hand through his hair. He's wearing a short sleeved button up white shirt, a brown vest on top of it, a very cowboy aesthetic, which is aided by his deep brown boots with chromed spurs jangling on the floor. At his side is a weapon in a holster that looks a little bit too big to be a handgun and a little bit too small to be a rifle. It almost gives you the vague impression of a sawed-off shotgun, this matte black weapon that has a very small profile uh, with two barrels. As he pulls his hand away from his hair, he leans forward away from the mess of flesh behind him and extends that hand to meet your grip in a careless handshake. Claudius, I know you so well, if only by reputation. How are you? Well, Mr. Felix, it's a genuine pleasure. I, I apologize I, I didn't find you earlier tonight. It is no trouble at all. I believe your nephew has made me more than comfortable right here. And he smiles broadly as he looks to the people surrounding him. He certainly has a gift for making people uh, right at home. And I, I would welcome you to our home. I, I, I'm hoping that we can have a, uh, a long and, and fruitful conversation when, when perhaps we're not so uh, drowned in the, the pleasures of the party. Well, wherever you find yourself off to, please be sure to return soon because I believe 
believe. And he like taps on his watch on his left arm, this like overly garish silver thing. I believe my time might be very soon. Well, I will endeavor to find you before that time comes. I hear you have quite a, a penchant for, for weapons and for hunting. And if, if you know anything about our family, we, we certainly are good at the first, if maybe not the latter. He seems to brush past the vague blackmailish implications of what you've dropped with remarkable charm as he says, um, well, thank you very much for your hospitality and I hope to talk to you soon. Claudius uh, nods and carefully extracts himself and seeing Kaz and this other group at the elevator walks quickly, but trying not to look too hurried, trying not to draw any attention to it and walks over to the elevator and, and sort of raises an eyebrow at Kaz. There's something going on nephew. Kaz's grin is irrepressible as he uh, l- lets Claudius inside and then punches the floor combination in to take them down to the shooting range. Ulysses, you can probably explain it better than I can, but let me take the first run at it. Keaton fucked the security up. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> You can have a Betty Isaac. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hell yeah. You can hear Claudius's teeth squeak together as he grits and clenches his jaw and forces a smile. Perhaps not something we need to talk about at the moment, Kaz. What's going on? Kaz realizes he doesn't know even as he opens his mouth to speak and just sort of like turns on his heel to Ulysses and points his hands at him like, uh, you know. Ulysses offers Claudius a professional smile and uh, extends a hand as he joins them. Claudius, it's nice to see you. Uh, Maybe not under these circumstances. The short of it is... There's a camera feed, some sort of firing range. I, I, I don't know what actually happened, but it looks like there might have been some sort of accident involving my sister. When he says it's his sister, all of Vivian's cybernetic seams pulse brighter at once. Uh, Ulysses also casts a sidelong glance at uh, Hazel, who is standing amongst them, but does not say anything to her. As the doors open into one of these basement floors of the tower, Ulysses and Hazel are the last to leave, and you just hear her voice almost a whisper behind her. I should have been downstairs. I don't know what my sister's doing down here, Hazel. It's possible she gave you the slip on purpose. I don't know. I know you do your job, Will. Don't blame yourself just yet. And then we'll quickly follow the others unless there's more to be said. Her jaw tightens as you exit into this ancient structure. Vivian has run ahead. She's at the head of the pack. Her heels make click clacks. Ulysses is also making haste, uh, although he is not as athletically inclined. The bowels of the tower have not changed much in the last 200 years. A concrete fortification. It gives you the vibe of walking through a nuclear bunker meant to resist immense attacks. And in fact, that's not far off from the truth. The lighting is new in here, but nothing else is. Uh, Much of the concrete has worn away into that rough, bumpy texture that it does over time. Slopes in the floor made by footfalls over time are present everywhere as the click clacks echo down the halls. Kaz has been down here before, obviously. I think Claudius has been down here before. The other two of you probably have not. Although it's probably few and far between. It's not a very aesthetically pleasing looking place. And it's definitely not a place you bring guests. Primarily, it is a place reserved for the testing of edicts uh, created in this very building. Uh, But Kaz can lead the way easily enough. You open a small steel door into the shooting range uh, that has a similar aesthetic to the concrete you've walked through around, the same thing you saw on camera. The lights in here are flashing, the ones that remain alight, a dim yellow haze um, in a smoky room. You see immediately bodies on the floor, one of them black scorch marks everywhere that you can recognize some of the features, and at the very least, the now uh, blackened ruin purple shawl of Luella. The attendant that was in this room is blackened and scarred in a twisted manner that makes you think they are definitely dead, uh, just to the left of Luella. 
Tanya is laying uh, against the wall. It seems like she's missed the brunt of it. One of her arms is sort of black and messed up, but she appears to be unconscious against the wall, and Luella is obviously unconscious as well. Some of her body has been like burned in that way where it's just a mixture of black and red, uh, and there's sort of blood coming out of some of her burns. That's the situation you see. Up to this point, Ulysses has managed to keep his head on straight for the most part. Hundreds of thoughts have crossed his mind in the maybe short minutes it took to reach this location, but most prominent among them is, you know, this is his sister. They might not be close, but she's still some of the only family he has, and all he could tell from the video feed was it was likely some sort of catastrophe, so he prevented himself from jumping to conclusions until assessing the situation directly, but I think upon seeing her blackened form, he immediately sprints over and is in a combination of worrying over her state and trying to medically assess what is happening and determine if she is in fact still alive. All right. Um, make a healing roll for me, man. It's a one and a three. Uh, I'll, I'll spend a Benny on this. This is important for Ulysses, but uh, that is a four. She appears to be alive, but in pretty bad shape. Her breathing is uh, shallow and it comes in waves. There's like, you know, I think you don't take that long, but there's this period of like five seconds where she just doesn't breathe at all before slowly breathing back in, but she appears to be alive. The state of her injuries is pretty bad. You're not sure how long she could survive in this condition, but you would imagine not very long. He mutters to himself under his breath, partly from panic and partly ingrained work habits as he is used to functioning in a solitary manner and speaks out loud to himself as he does things. So we see him move through vitals, you know, checking for breath, checking pulse, seeing if there's any kind of responsiveness while doing his best to not move or disturb her as he is not a trained medical professional. But when he's able to determine that she is still alive, he lets out a shaky breath and uh, simply she's alive for now and then uh, turns to Kaz and Claudius and says do you have medical facilities on site an on-call doctor anything something uh, m the medical profession is one of the few things that is not allowed to be licensed so yes of course I, I think at the first bit of you mentioning that she's alive like Kaz probably like starts running towards the emergency button on the on the wall like this is a shooting range there's yeah. gonna be like a, a few a few buttons for protocols like that especially since it's for testing weapons so uh, unless Claudius would want to stop him for some reason uh, like I think he would just sprint straight to that button and mash it uh, Claudius has been standing there looking down at this scene play out and his eyes sort of have glazed over see this shot of just his face and you can hear things going going on in the background muted and there's like something whispering in his ear lost in like an old memory in this place and as soon as he hears she's alive and Kaz start to run over he he blinks and snaps out of it Kaz stop you'll you'll set the alarm off for the entire place here let let me do it and he'll he'll sort of go over to the wall and punch into a pad some credential and just open up and type something out and set off the same effective thing but without setting off the entire building's alarm that something's gone wrong while that's going on we see vivian move over and kneel down uh, to her one of her best friends in the world uh, and she slowly reaches out her hand uh, towards her face and if this is okay ali I think she moves with her thumb and her index finger, uh, like not quite believing her friend is all right, you know, and opening up her closed eye. As you open it up, th there's no one staring back at you. It is a pupil of an eyeball, almost all black, just this massive spot uh, where everything else that makes up an eye used to be, just staring blankly at the ceiling like eye drops on steroids this blank black stare vivian lets the eyelid fall shut again and i think she just sits there for a while over claudius and kaz bickering in the background and ulysses muttering to himself beside her and she just says how did this happen how is this allowed to happen where were the people Kaz is frozen in the background. He 
stopped moving when he almost hit that button. And now he just terrified looks to Claudius. I think uh, Ulysses Vivian's tone snaps him out of his safe work mode and he comes back to the reality of the situation and somewhat shakily pushes himself to his feet and we see his hands clench and unclench several times. They move to his forearms as though to pull up sleeves that are not actually there and then he turns back to the two crows and he says, how did my sister find this place? How, how did she reach this location? She doesn't appear to have been escorted by anyone from your family or familiar with the building. There's an attendant here. I find myself asking similar questions, Ulysses. Why were people down here? I haven't been down here in, in 15 years, let alone anyone else. It, I, I think you'll, you'll have to accept my, my apology that I don't know and my reassurance that we will find out. Is the edict anywhere? Was it yeah, destroyed? Yeah, I was going to ask. Same thing. Yeah, I, I didn't mention it because I thought your attention would be drawn to the body first. But as you look around Ulysses, yeah, you can see the scattered remains of this weapon that she was using. It's broken mostly in half. And then some elements of it, you know, have exploded and been scattered around the room. I, I think it's gotten knocked half of it underneath the table where you'd reload and stage. And then uh, the other half is like peaking out from behind her shoulder. Ulysses turns and glances at these pieces and waves a hand to them, even as he turns to go and check on Tanya to see if she shows signs of life as well. She was testing that edict. It seems to have exploded. Perhaps malfunctioned. I don't know. That's... I don't know. When Ulysses mentions the edict, I think Kaz looks to Claudius and perhaps takes a step closer to him and in a lower voice, are we? Would Kaz know if, if we had recently sold an edict? I think we've been on hiatus from selling them for a while. Claudius would know for sure. As soon as the word edict is said and Kaz leans in, he grips his hand onto Kaz's shoulder and squeezes down like a vice. What do you mean there's an edict? I, I think your eyes uh, look past Kaz, Claudius, to uh, the scattered remains of this weapon. Probably the most identifiable features would be the grip that's still intact and the end of the barrel. If you move past Kaz to examine either of them further, you've been pretty entrenched in the family business for your entire life. You have an almost encyclopedic knowledge. If you look at a gun, you can almost recognize the name and who it was con commissioned for and who is the current owner of it. And the weapon you see before you is not a weapon your family has ever sold and to your knowledge, ever created. This very strange look passes over Claudius's face. Confusion and anger and like desperation all mixed up in one and it, it passes really quickly uh, and is replaced with this carefully neutral look. Ulysses, you didn't say anything about an edict when we came down here. Let me see it. He'll sort of pick it up and examine it. Is there any way to check quickly whether it is holding anyone, even in its like broken state, does it still contain remnants of, of a person or of a soul? Yeah, how much of an engineer are you, I guess? That is not Claudius's bag. His, his wife was always involved in that intimately, so I'm sure he picked up some odd knowledge and some experience in talking with her about it and seeing her work, uh, but it's not something that he's very aware of. Then I think... Like you're aware of the components, you're aware of all these things that go into it and, and the core which you search for, uh, what makes an edict an edict is this central small quantum computer held within it that forms a artificial net of neurons which can hold the electrical impulses of uh, the various brains that uh, it takes into its stead. You don't have a way to check that. I think that would require uh, equipment uh, that you don't have. Maybe Ulysses would have. But you can tell that that part of the edict is intact. 
Is it possible that because we're in a firing range, is this the sort of place where if we're developing and testing these weapons, would we have something on hand, maybe something Claudius doesn't understand, but at least knows that like there's equipment here that you can tweak and change this neural net or, or dial in the weapons as they're developed? Is that the sort of equipment we could find or that would be nearby? If you want to spend a Benny, there could definitely be something in here that could do something very similar to that yeah sure yeah I'll, I'll spend a penny on that yeah I think um it probably looks like somewhere between like if Ridley Scott was responsible for the design of a 3d printer or a CNC machine this like highly technical but also very clunky device I think it's intended to receive a, a full gun in it a full edict but I think you could do something with this um I I think that's probably a repair role I think he would hold this core out towards Ulysses with this this strangely tight grip on it as well. I know you by reputation, sir. Can I bank on that reputation for some discretion here? So Ulysses is down uh, checking Tanya as as he holds this out. Uh, is Tanya also still alive? I'm, I'm not going to make you roll a, a healing check for that. I think it's much more clear that she's alive immediately. Her breathing pattern's a lot more regular. You open her eye and you see her, her pupil react. Um, she's unconscious, but uh, she appears to be alive. And like she has superficial injuries, unless she has internal organ damage you're not sure of, but she does appear to be alive. He checks her and then uh, pushes himself back back up to his feet and turns around to see Claudius holding the piece of the edict out to him. He meets Claudius's eyes and I feel like they probably have one of those long moments of understanding the gravity of this situation and the political ramifications of what has already happened and the fallout that could still happen depending on Luella's actual condition. But his eyes fall to the piece of the edict and he walks over and takes it with slow, deliberate motions. And he says, it's been some years, Claudius, but uh, you do know my reputation. So I'm sure you know that I love to invade privacy. And then he takes the, the quantum computer unit and walks over to the receptacle and does his best to configure it accordingly. Uh, what information are you trying to glean specifically before we roll? That's a, a good question and maybe one that he would pose to Claudius. And he'll say, I have very limited knowledge of the workings of these devices. What are you, what am I looking for? Well, Mr. Rook, it's possible that wherever this, I hesitate to use the word counterfeit, edict came from, it's possible it was constructed around that core and stolen from this facility. It's also possible that some measure of your sister is contained within it, or it's possible that some other evidence as to who perpetrated this is contained within that unit as well. Can't pretend to understand exactly how they work. There's matrices and quantum and all sorts of other words that I don't understand, but I do know that they are containers, and I'm hoping that we can find that that one's filled with our answer. I think the word counterfeit is what twigs most to Ulysses, and he pauses, looking back to Claudius over his shoulder. Counterfeit? So you, you deny that this device was manufactured by the crows? Is such a thing even possible? Do you remember the part where I said that I could count on your discretion? I do. Then I think this is a conversation that we need to have at a later time. I think his jaw works slightly, but he accepts the pragmatic answer for what it is and realizes that there are more important items at hand. So he will return his attention to the edict's core and do his best to hook it up and search for any information that he might be able to interpret and pass along. 
uh, what would you like me to? You said it was going to be a repair. Uh, what I assume this is probably going to have some steep penalties. Yeah, man. Um, he's not completely unfamiliar with edicts, but th- sure. this is also like the Crow family legacy. This is not something that most people have any working knowledge of. I would expect. Yeah, and I, using like a Crow workbench too. Yeah, that's yeah. True. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I know you spent a Benny on this, Claudius, but I think this is going to be a negative four. All the reasons you listed, you probably don't have practical knowledge of artificial neuron nets. Maybe a little bit with quantum computing, you aren't familiar with the technology and like this is all proprietary stuff you have never seen before, not to mention it's damaged. Sure. I haven't made the rule yet, but as Ulysses sets to work at the bench, he holds his right forearm out above the piece of the edict, and similar to how his knuckle hex moved out of the way when he used his data port, uh, we see sort of a riffling in the skin on his arm, and a whole series of the honeycomb pattern vibrates to life and then lifts up in a way to reveal that there is a good deal of internal circuitry and internal mechanics uh, and containers that are bared to the open air and several mechanized tools come out on hydraulic servos almost like spider limbs uh, that then angle down and begin to work softly on the edict. So his cyber tools normally give him a plus two to repair, but I don't know that that should apply in the circumstance, just due to the nature of the difficulty. I would say not. So I will be rolling at a minus four. Uh, I got a five minus. That's bad. Um, Benny that. uh, Yeah, I'm gonna Benny Benny this because I really I would like this to work, but blew up a six into a six into a six. Into a three. Damn. Holy shit. Fuck. Fuck. I saw <laughs> that. Uh, oh my 21 god. Twenty-one minus four is a seventeen. Are you just god typing on a computer? It. And then, like in the nineties, you just say, "I'm in." I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, and I can't um, get back out. <laughs> if you need a second to think while that's happening, Caleb, we could cut to Kaz and Vivian and the doctor coming in. Oh, I I did want to say something about that. Oh, I got some shit to say. Yeah, g- give give me a second to think. Let's say that um, it's going to take you a little bit, Ulysses, so tell me what's going on in the background sure. while I uh, don't listen. So while, while that's beginning to happen, Kaz, released somewhat from the grip of Claudius, I think steps, st- steps up next to his friend Vivian and probably reaches out and puts a gentle hand on her arm. She's going to be okay. She she will. We don't know that. Uh, well, uh, and and he like gently like helps her step to the side as the door behind them opens and a like a, a medical crash team comes running in. Well, I don't want to totally yuck your yum, but here's here's what I was thinking. I don't think Claudius called the doctor yet. Oh, no okay. Shit. I I think Claudius put something into the wall, and if we watched over his shoulder, he sent a message to Keaton instead. Damn. And he hasn't called anyone. And there's sort of this dreadful algebra going through his head of, if I have to kill these two down here, what's that going to do to our family? How do we get out of that? Is it worthwhile to do so? And he's still sort of running those numbers in his head. Well, then I I think Kaz, like, still... Still, like, helps Vivian step to the side, maybe away from the door, just in anticipation of a medical crash team coming through. And Caleb, I'm I'm happy to roll on something to, like, act cool while that's happening, or I don't know if that's a roll or, or something that we need to do, but... That'd probably um, be performance, that, right? Yeah, that that does seem appropriate. Yeah, let's do performance posed by Spirit. Uh, Ulysses does not get an attempt at this. That's fair. Cool. I, I will um, check that out with my Spirit. Well... It's a good thing he's he's pretty good at performance because he is a lawyer. That's fair. It's a low bar for you because I roll a three and a two. I'm going to Benny mine preemptively. I don't like that. You know what? I will too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rolling a ten and a three. So. I'm going to Benny that again. But what if I spend one more Benny? Because these are all garbage. <laughs> you got this. Well, guess I'm guess I'm staying with a five. 
I rolled a 19. Oh, oh my god. I, I, I blew up a D8 twice. I've been there. Damn. Twice today, actually. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's pretty good at what he does. Yeah, that's fair. I also, I bennied into an eight, so uh, uh, and neither of us neither of us picked up on it, Allie. Yeah, Vivian is too distracted. Ulysses is off working on something, and Claudius leans down, eyes full of either real or very well pretended concern, sort of squats down next to her. Are you, have you ever seen this weapon before that did this? Does it seem like I've seen it before? Of course fucking I, not. I, I ask not to be indelicate, but because it may give us a hint of how to treat what's happened to her. I think uh, the conversation from earlier has just been playing at like half speed in her head since she came into the room and is just fuging. But the word matching keeps echoing in her head because like they they're best friends. They would put together matching outfits and their lipstick matched tonight because she forgot, you know, her spare in the car and she wanted a matching edict too. And she side eyes Claudius and rubs her fingers together while she's thinking, how often are counterfeits getting out like this? Because I'll tell you, I come from a family where the biggest counterfeit issue we have to worry about is a goddamn purse. How are you allowing counterfeit edicts to exist? Get your fucking house in order. Vivian, you know as well as I do that I can't answer that question in good conscience. You understand that. What I can offer you is that no fake edict will leave this house without our investigation and our knowledge, and we will end it and end whoever brought them. Do you understand that? That remains to be seen. It's an important question. Are we going to cooperate and bring justice to your friend and to get my fucking house in order? Or is this something that we need to discuss further? Well, you know, I love negotiating. It's my favorite part. I, as I recall, you're very good at it. You've raked me over the coals enough times to remember. You better buckle up. I think at that, Claudia stands up and goes over to, to fiddle with the keypad again and actually does call a medical team. Ulysses, you've, you've rolled an insane amount here. I, I think you can determine quite a few things. I mean, you must be, I mean, you are some kind of savant, although perhaps it's cybernetically enhanced. I'm not sure. But you like very quickly piece together um, what you're searching for here. Perhaps it's the distress in your wife's voice behind you. Perhaps it's whatever care you still have for your sister. Or perhaps, more likely, it's simply for the thrill of it. You search through breaking this thing down very easily into like these digital component parts and you find out a lot of information about this thing. Number one, it was made very recently. It was made within the last two weeks. Number two, it's definitely not an edict made by the Crow family. Third, it is made with impeccable quality. You compare the scans of this edict to uh, the many scans you've taken before of edicts with your various cyberware and find that they're very, very similar. Whoever was responsible for making uh, this chip has done a damn good job making a counterfeit. You can tell this gun has been branded. There is an afterlife that has been created in this gun and currently you see one conglomeration of now digitized neurons firing through it. And it appears that one soul is trapped in whatever afterlife exists in this gun. I think you also can tell that whatever life the person now in this gun is living is not a pleasant one. So his his sister is still physically alive. Does he know yes. for a fact that that means that this could not be her inside the edict? You have an ominous feeling in your gut that it could be your sister in the gun. However, 
that kind of breaks the rules as far as you know. She shouldn't still be breathing if that were true. But putting that with your role and the role you made on healing and the look Vivian saw in her eye, it's heads or tails, but it definitely could be her inside the gun. As Ulysses loses himself in the familiar safe and comfortable passion of work. He hears the din of conversation continue in the background and at the utter fire and venom in his wife's voice, I think he feels just a a distinct swelling of affection and pride knowing that this matters to her just as much as if not more so than him and that helps to spur him on to greater heights and he just utterly loses himself in the process and these edicts are incredible pieces of technology something that is not entirely alien or foreign to him but something new uh, that he hasn't dared to poke around with or experiment with in any kind of tangible way so being able to to drift through these neural circuits and see how all the pieces connect and just get a greater idea of the scope of this construct is invigorating and exciting and enthralling, but also utterly taboo to know that this is not the genuine article and the the shock and revulsion that someone was able to make such a convincing replica and that it seems to have worked or almost worked in the way that it was intended. And then I think the additional realization hits him as what if it did work as intended? What if it was a plant? What if it was meant to explode? If the person trapped inside this is his sister, where did she get it? Who did she get it from? What what led her to this moment? Because for all he can tell, Claudius is telling the truth, and I think that might be what scares him the most. So as he connects all these dots and reaches this realization and has a moment of suspended terror that his sister might now be trapped inside a hellish reality from which there is very likely no escape, he removes himself from the examination and turns back to survey the room once more, his eyes falling on the charred husk of her body. Distorted though it is, it shares many physical similarities to his with the the sharp angular facial features, and he feels a pang of shame and guilt and remorse for even reaching this moment in the first place. And he says, I've finished gathering what I can. It's it's not genuine. It's a counterfeit or copy or something like that. It's new. It was made within the last two weeks. It's of a high quality, a worrying high quality that should not be attainable based on what we know. There is an afterlife. It has been branded and there is at least one, I think only one soul within it. I don't know for certain who it is, but it might be Luella. It should not be possible, but it might be her. And I think he returns his gaze to Claudius and doesn't know what to think or feel, but he feels anger and guilt and shame fighting for control, and it's all he can do to simply exist. When she hears him say that Luella's in. Luella is probably trapped. She almost immediately abandons the body because she believes him 100%. She trusts him implicitly in everything he does. And she goes over to him and doesn't touch him because he doesn't always like that. But she waits. As he was relaying the information, I think it was easier for him to treat it clinically. But when he had to admit that it could be her and the gun, he looks to Vivian last of all, because they're the only ones that really care on a personal level in this moment. And he probably believes that it's going to hurt her more than it'll hurt him.
Thank you for listening to Sounds Like Crows Terminus. If you liked what we do here, please make sure to like and review. That's the best way to help support this show for free. And if you're feeling a bit generous with coin, you can join our Patreon for access to our Discord and be in the ranks of folks such as Greg Gray, Ariel Weiss, Jared, Kirby, and Jeremy Dunlap, along with Prime, David Hayes, Ethan Saperstein, and Wade Bernier. Casted this week are myself, Caleb Sunstead, who you can find at Marshall Caleb on Twitter, Isaac Sunstead, who played Kaz Crow on Twitter at Abel the Crow, Claudius Crow, who is played by Austin Holt, Ulysses Rook, who is played by Doug Nesbitt, who you can find on his show, RPG for You and Me, wherever you're listening to this podcast. And Vivian Rook was played by Ali Nesbitt, who you can find on Twitter at You See the Hat, or the same on Instagram, or also on her show at RPG for You and Me dot com. Music was by William Ecker or myself, who you can find at musicdirecker.bandcamp.com. Special thanks to Kate Downs for story assistance on last episode in this one, along with special thanks to my good friend Cameron Reed for doing a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff. And if you follow us on Twitter, at Sounds of Crows, he's the one you'll most likely be talking to. Our executive producer is Alexandria Majan, at Alexandria Majan on Twitter. Thanks for sticking around for the credits, folks. See you next time.